Greetings everyone, this is Brother Carl Tester and welcome back to Revelation 16 and the 7th Vial of Wrath. This is the 7th of the 7 last plagues as it says in Revelation 15 verse 1 and Revelation 21 verse 9 and this meets us right where we are today. It started in the 20th century and it seems to be reaching a climax in this 21st century and perhaps even in this decade, but time will tell. Whatever the case is, this is going to be very exciting. In this first part, I'm going to briefly recap on where we are now at in the prophetic timeline, and then I'm going to look at a purely symbolic meaning of the vial poured out into the air. In the subsequent parts, I'm going to consider the beginning of a literal fulfillment of the vial of wrath being poured out into the air, which started to emerge at the end of World War, World War I. Then it moved up several gears when World War II came along and has been growing ever since. After exploring this, I'm going to consider the meaning of the prophecy where it states that that great city was divided into three parts, so there's lots of ground to cover. In stark contrast to the followers of both Futurism and Preterism, we have seen the hand of God in the affairs of men down through the last 2,000 years. We have followed the historical progression of prophecy, commencing from about 100 AD, the golden age of the Roman Empire, through to its decline and fall under both the seven seals and the first four trumpets. This collapse first happened in the West, and then we saw the decline and fall of the Eastern Roman Empire under the scourge of Islam as detailed in the fifth and sixth trumpets. We saw that as a direct result of the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, which came to its full end in AD 1453, that this allowed the Reformation to break out back in Europe. We saw that while the pagan Roman Empire had collapsed in the West, in AD 476, that following this, it did in fact re-emerge as the Papal Roman Empire and that Europe had been held in its iron grip for over a thousand years and that the mass of peoples there were in great spiritual darkness and bondage. The Papal Roman Empire is seen in the prophecy as this exceedingly dreadful fourth beast which has seven heads and ten horns and it also contains all the characteristics of the empires that went before it, those being the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian and of course the Pagan Roman Empire. From this terrible fourth beast arose a little horn that is, the papacy to rule over them all, to rule over the ten kingdoms of Europe. But this rule started to crumble with the outbreak of the European Reformation, and we must thank the Lord for that. All of these things brought us to the end of the 18th century, and there we followed the spectacular outbreak of the French Revolution and the wars that followed this, and which resulted in the loss of papal temporal power. The prophecy then brought us through the 19th century and into the opening of the 20th century and with this we saw the end of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, the great river Euphrates which had overflowed its banks under the sixth trumpet in Revelation 9, now dried up completely following the end of World War I. This set the stage for the way of the kings of the east to emerge onto the world scene as well as a trinity of evil which came forth with the three unclean spirits. Spirits that came out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet and these three evil spirits have gone forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This is the battle of Armageddon, but it is not a battle yet to be fought over in a place found in the Middle East, in the land of Israel, but rather it is the age in which we now live, the age where peace has been taken from the earth. And I personally believe that this started to occur with World War I, but really developed much further with World War II and is obviously quickly reaching a climax 
as we can clearly see in this year 2022. So with that introduction in mind, we now need to understand as best we can, or I can, what the seventh file relates to. Is it in play presently, or does it relate to something that is yet to occur, or perhaps is it a bit of both? We have seen over and over again through the seven seals, trumpets, and also with the first six vials, that there is often an overlap of events. As one event is still in play, the next event starts to unfold, and the reason for this is that prophecy follows real history. No kingdom, nation, or empire rises in a day, and they don't fall in a day either. There are always key opening and closing events or eras in the life of an empire or ruling body. Some of these key events occur very close to each other and even overlap each other. In my view, this is what we have here. Vials 6 and 7 are overlapping each other. Obviously, we can clearly see that the Turkish Ottoman Empire is well out of the way. The drying up of the great river Euphrates under the sixth vial is over and done with. However, still under the sixth vial, we can see that the role of the kings of the east has not yet played its full part, at least as far as I can see. And also the operation of the three unclean spirits, that hasn't yet played its full part either. That has been underway since near enough to the beginning of the 20th century and is still ongoing. As we're going to go on and see, aspects of the seventh vial started to come to pass near to the close of World War I and definitely moved up a gear coming into World War II and yet there is still more to this. The prophecy states that the great city was divided into three parts. What does this mean and how are we to understand this as historicists, recognizing that not everything has been fulfilled? We are now in the 21st century and we are still examining the prophecy to try and understand where we are at in the prophetic timeline. Now let's turn to the prophecy, Revelation 16, starting in verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. The first thing that I believe is very important to note is that the pouring out of the seventh vial does not cause repentance. It does not cause the nations or the people to turn to God, at least at this particular point. From our perspective, this may be unfortunate because it means that there is still yet more to occur. It's only when we get to Revelation chapter 18, chapters 18 and 19, that we see mystery Babylon smashed to pieces, never ever to rise again. And I'm going to talk about that when I get there, God willing. But for now, we need to understand that this seventh vial spoken of in Revelation 16 does not bring about the consummation of all things at this particular point. The prophecy tells us that the vial is poured out into the air. We note in Ephesians 2, verse 2, it says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
The devil does not have power over the air, but rather he has power in the region of the air. And this is the same Greek word used back in Revelation 16, verse 17. And it is referring, the word is referring to the lower and denser air as distinguished from the higher and rarer air. Rarer air, sorry about that. It is the atmospheric region. In other words, the devil has power in the region where man is living and operating. And we can be sure of this since the verse does go on and tell us that this power is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And this is right here where we are. Now I'm going to add something to this that might be a little bit of a surprise to you, but the children of disobedience are first and foremost the descendants of the Israelite people of the Bible, and these are the peoples who form the Anglo-Saxon nations of the earth today. It was these people that God gave the old covenant to and they trampled all over it. And then he promised to give them the new covenant, the Christian covenant. And this is verified in both Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews chapter 8. These people have disseminated the gospel all over the world. And it is these people who are, for the most part, the children of disobedience. They walk away from God instead of walking to him. As we are going to see later on in this presentation, especially in part three, we're going to see the national wickedness that comes out of our Western nations show that the prince of the power of the air is operating well in those nations. Most unfortunate, but this is the way it is. This is not something that we need to look to any other part of the world to find. No, not deepest, darkest Africa or some other place, although it will be there, we do find it clearly in our Western nations. As we relate this back to Revelation 16 verse 17, we can see that this is possibly telling us of the terrible judgment of God coming forth, being poured out into the air, that is, upon the power of Satan in the affairs of men. And I think that Practically speaking, this is going to mean that we will see the unmistakable judgment of God take place first and foremost, first and foremost rather, in our Western nations. We need to remember that God is not only dealing with individuals, he is dealing with the nations, and the Anglo-Saxon nations that should be the light on the hill among all the nations of the earth are in fact in great spiritual darkness and bondage, and God is going to bring forth his judgment upon this. And in the process, he will still save his people. Amen. The fact that God can bring great judgment upon our Western nations, yet at the same time still preserve his people, the remnant according to the election of grace, is absolutely no problem to the God we serve. In Jeremiah 30 verse 7 it says, Alas, for that day... For that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Praise the Lord. Also, we have a clear example of this being done in the past, and this is in Hosea chapter 1, and we pick it up in verse 4, where we read how that God would cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And this is precisely what God did. He used the rod of his anger, the Assyrians, to destroy the kingdom of Israel. But at the same time, he preserved his people. It says in that same chapter in verse 10, Yet... The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. The things that are spoken of in Hosea chapter 1 have actually been historically fulfilled already, and this explains why Christianity is seated in our Western Anglo-Saxon nations, and once again, I'm going to direct you to my series on the two houses of Israel, as this is going to explain everything to you. But coming back to Revelation chapter 16 and the vial being poured out into the air, what I believe that we are going to see is that the kingdom of our Western nations has to be and will be destroyed. The body politic, which is rotten to the core, has to be destroyed. It is Babylonian and it has to fall never to rise again. How God is going to do this by war or other means, 
I don't know. But what I do know is that he will preserve his people. Praise the Lord. Amen. So while we see terrible things going on in our Western governments, and we do, and while we may yet go through persecution and hardship, each one of us must trust in the Lord that he is going to bring us through all of this. Amen. Concerning the vial being poured out into the air, Eliot says this in the Horae Apocalyptica. There is to arise, all suddenly and fearfully, some extraordinary convulsion, darkening and vitiation of its political atmosphere, the permitted effect perhaps in God's righteous judgment of the, of the working to a crisis of those evil principles. I thus explain the air in the apocalyptic vision to mean the European political and moral atmosphere after the analogy of the apocalyptic firmament, which has been construed on, I think, undoubted evidence to symbolize the political firmament. Eliot would, of course, be thinking of the European continent when he says these things. But when we look at the prophecy today, we can understand that Babylon is no longer just located in Rome, in the Vatican, on the continent, but it is also in our Western nations. It's in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And when we understand this, I think we can agree that our political firmament, through which our corrupted Babylonian financial system operates, our corrupted education system operates, the military machine which the United States of America sends all over the world to interfere with the affairs of different nations here and there, the system under which Big Pharma flourishes, this is the firmament in which the Prince of the Power of the Air is operating today, and this is that which God will bring into judgment and disarray. I think that noteworthy at the present time is the Russian-Ukrainian war, which is in a European setting, obviously, and it is vitiating the political atmosphere of Europe and the rest of the Western world. Dealing with Russia is a major problem for Europe, as Europe is heavily dependent on Russia for gas. Now, obviously, it's hard to tell which way all of this will go. Many see that this has the potential to quickly escalate into World War III and go nuclear. However, it may die down or even go on for years with no resolution. It may be that this event is that which is prophesied in Ezekiel 38, which deals with Gog and Magog, and where it says in verse 4 of that chapter, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws and bring thee forth. Note the prophecy first says, I will turn thee back, and then it says, I will bring thee forth. What does this relate to? Well, the Soviets were turned back during the end of the Cold War period between 1988 and 1991, but now, through aggressive Eastern expansion policies adopted by the USA and NATO, they have forced Russia to come forth. This is not something that Russia wanted to do, but they've been forced to do this to protect their borders. I'm not saying that this is the meaning of the prophecy, time will tell what will come of all of this. However, it is quite interesting. Eliot continues, the only other instance in the apocalypse wherein the air is spoken of as affected, that is to say, on occasion of issuing from the pit of the abyss of the smoke and miasma of Mohammedanism, quote, whereby the sun and the air were darkened, end quote. We know from history that there resulted an agitation and tainting of the moral and political atmosphere of Greek Christendom. Now, if you are unsure of what Eliot is talking about here, you will need to go back and look at my part dealing with Revelation chapter 9. But assuming you understand this, then we can see that the previous use of air in the book of Revelation did indeed refer to the moral and political atmosphere of the Eastern Roman Empire, which was darkened by the coming forth of the Islamic hordes, firstly with the Saracens and then later with the Ottomans. Still with Eliot we read, nor does it seem to me improbable that some ominous derangement of the natural atmosphere may furnish a literal groundwork for the figure nearly contemporarily. 
So Eliot is acknowledging that the symbolic language used may also see a literal fulfillment in natural phenomena of the same kind. And I'm going to talk more about this in the next part where we will look at a literal aspect of the prophecy that relates to the air that Eliot was not able to anticipate as he passed away before he could see what would unfold in the 20th century. Still with Eliot we read, Nor does it seem to me improbable that some ominous derangement of the natural atmosphere may furnish a literal groundwork for the figure nearly contemporarily. Now note here that uh, Eliot opens the door uh, for the possibility that there might be some kind of literal fulfillment that plays out in connection with the vial being poured out into the air. Now at the point in time that Eliot lived and wrote, he did not see what was to happen in the 20th century and, and beyond. But we have, so in the next part, I'm going to furnish a literal fulfillment of the vial being poured out into the air, a thing that Eliot was not able to anticipate because the technology wasn't there at the point in time when Eliot wrote. So keep an eye out for that. He continues, Doubtless under the judgment of the seventh vial, if I have rightly explained it, we must expect this convulsion, vitiation and darkening of the political and moral atmosphere in Western Europe to be unprecedentedly awful. Eliot continues, Doubtless under the judgment of the seventh vial, if I have rightly explained it, we must expect this convulsion, vitiation and darkening of the political and moral atmosphere in Western Europe to be unprecedentedly awful. As I draw this part to a close, we read in verse 18, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And this prophetic language is, of course, indicating tremendous wars and tumults throughout the earth. The 20th century has given us two world wars, the 21st century looks set to give us perhaps the last and greatest of these, so we can rightly expect a lot more of distress of nations with perplexity before things get any better. And who knows what we might also see with natural phenomena of the same kind. Perhaps great topographical changes will accompany this, as some believe Zechariah chapter 14 is pointing to. Time will tell. And with that, I'll end part one. In the following parts, we're going to expand a lot more on different aspects of this prophecy.